This episode is brought to you by Tonal, T-O-N-A-L. Get ready for the smartest home gym you've ever seen. That's a men's health headline about Tonal, folks, and that gives you the gist. If you're wondering about the smart part, Tonal's homepage also features a quote from the New York Times. Quote, the machine knew my strength better than I did. End quote. More on that in just a minute. By eliminating traditional metal weights, Tonal can deliver 200 pounds of resistance in a device smaller than a flat screen TV. Tonal mounts on your wall with no floor space required. I've had a Tonal unit now for 6 to 12 months, which I got after a number of very close friends recommended Tonal, and it allows me to do things I would normally need a much larger gym for, like cable chop and lift or rotational exercises, things I wrote about in the 4-Hour Body, and it allows me to do these things that are nearly impossible otherwise, like eccentric loading, which I'll mention later. Tonal is precision engineered and designed to be the world's most advanced strength studio and personal trainer. It uses breakthrough technology, like adaptive digital weights and AI learning, together with the best experts in resistance training, so you get stronger faster. So what are these adaptive digital weights? Tonal's patented digital weight system makes thousands of calculations a second, to deliver you a smooth weightlifting experience using advanced electronic motor technology. Tonal lets you adjust the weight in one pound increments, something that was never possible with traditional dumbbells. It's easy to dial weights up and down with the touch of a button right in the grip itself. It's pretty cool. Tonal also has built-in dynamic weight modes like chains, eccentric, that's E-C-C-E-N-T-R-I-C, and their patent-pending SmartFlex technology so that you can experiment with more ways to get stronger, faster, without the hassle of extra equipment like chains and bands. And it, once again, fits on the wall like flat screen TV. So you can make the best use out of the smallest footprint in your home or garage, wherever you end up putting it. So try Tonal, T-O-N-A-L, the world's smartest home gym for 30 days in your home. And if you don't love it, you can return it for a full refund. Visit www.tonal.com, that's T-O-N-A-L, and for a limited time, get $100 off of the smart accessories when you use promo code TIM100 at checkout. That's www.tonal.com, promo code TIM100. Tonal, be your strongest. This episode is brought to you by All Form. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've probably heard me talk about Helix Sleep and their mattresses, which I've been using since 2017. I have two of them upstairs from where I'm sitting at this moment. And now Helix has gone beyond the bedroom and started making sofas. They just launched a new company called All Form, A-L-L-F-O-R-M, and they're making premium, customizable sofas and chairs shipped right to your door at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. So I'm sitting in my living room right now, and it's entirely All Form furniture. I've got two chairs, I've got an ottoman, and I have an L-sectional couch. And I'll come back to that. You can pick your fabric. They're all spill, stain, and scratch resistant. The sofa color, the color of the legs, the sofa size, the shape to make sure it's perfect for you in your home. Also, all form arrives in just three to seven days, and you can assemble it all yourself in a few minutes. No tools needed. I was quite astonished by how modular and easy these things fit together, kind of like Lego pieces. They've got armchairs, love seats, all the way up to an eight seat sectional. So there's something for everyone. You can also start small and kind of build on top of it if you wanted to get a smaller couch and then build out on it, which is actually in a way what I did because I can turn my L sectional couch into a normal straight couch and then with a separate ottoman in a matter of about 60 seconds. It's pretty rad. So I mentioned I have all of these different things in this room. I use the natural leg finish, which is their lightest color, and I dig it. I mean, I've been using these things hours and hours and hours every single day. So I am using what I am sharing with you guys. And if getting a sofa without trying it in store sounds risky, you don't need to worry. All form sofas are delivered directly to your home with fast free shipping, and you get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. That's more than three months, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund. Your sofa frame also has a forever warranty that's literally forever. So check it out. Take a look. They've got all sorts of cool stuff to choose from. I was skeptical and it actually worked. It worked much better than I could have imagined. And I'm very, very happy. So to find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash Tim. That's A-L-L-F-O-R-M dot com slash Tim. Allform is offering 20% off all orders to you, my dear listeners, at allform.com slash Tim. Make sure to use the code Tim at checkout. That's allform.com slash Tim and use code Tim at checkout. Optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I ask you a personal question? Now it is in the perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm 
a cybernetic organism, living tissue over metal endoskeleton. Hello boys and girls, ladies and germs, this is Tim Ferriss. Welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show. And I want to skip my long, usual preamble because we are going to run out of time before we run out of material. With today's guest, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time, many, many years, in fact. Dennis McKenna. You can find him on Twitter at Dennis McKenna 4 and we'll provide many other links. Dennis's research is focused on the interdisciplinary study of Amazonian ethnopharmacology. He has conducted extensive ethnobotanical fieldwork in the Peruvian Amazon, and we will define a lot of terms in this episode, so don't worry about getting lost in the weeds too quickly. His doctoral research at the University of British Columbia focused on the ethnopharmacology of ayahuasca and ukuhe, and we'll double check the pronunciation, two tryptamine-based hallucinogens used by indigenous peoples in the northwest Amazon. He is a founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute, which does exceptional work, and was a key organizer and participant in the Huasca Project, that's H-O-A-S-C-A Project, the first biomedical investigation of ayahuasca. He is the younger brother of Terence McKenna. From 2000 to 2017, he taught courses on ethnopharmacology as well as plants and human affairs at the Center for Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota. In 2019, in collaboration with colleagues, he incorporated a new nonprofit, the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, which we will discuss. In the spring of 2019, he emigrated to Canada with his wife, Sheila, and now resides in Abbotsford, British Columbia. You can find him on all the socials, Instagram at Dennis McKenna, Twitter at Dennis McKenna 4, Facebook at Dennis John, J-O-N McKenna, and also McKenna Academy, that's M-C-K-E-N-N-A, Academy on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. Dennis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. I thought I would I would start with a bit of history and pull in some colorful characters while we're at it. Could you please describe your first meeting with Richard Evan Schultes? And that can kind of segue into who Schultes was, but I really enjoyed this story in, in your book, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, which we will talk about. I've, I printed out my Amazon Kindle highlights. I have 189 highlights from that book. We're not going to go through them all, but let's start with your meeting with Schultes, if you wouldn't mind. Schultes was a professor at Harvard. He's been called the father of ethnobotany. He certainly was not, because ethnobotany as a discipline existed before there was Schultes. But he was one of the more high-profile people. He was the director of the Botanical Museum at Harvard University for many years. And he is he made many contributions to Amazonian botany, but the one he's most notorious for and most well known for is he was probably the world's expert on what we used to call hallucinogenic plants, psychedelic plants used in different parts of the world. But that was what made him so famous. And like many people, I envisioned a career in ethnopharmacology for myself, which is something that I sort of realized was possible when I was 18. We can go back to this. This is earlier than Schultes, when I got my hands on this amazing book called The Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. But I digress. We can return to that. So Schultes was a figure, of just a towering figure in this field, like Einstein in physics or of that stature, and many, many people with a passion about psychedelic plants and indigenous uh, use of these things, you know, looked up to Schultes and wanted to work with him. And I was one of those. And in 1974, I was living in Berkeley with my brother or close by my brother who was living there and I determined to go see the great man you know to make a <laughs> pilgrimage essentially to Schultes and in those days there was a deal you could buy a bus ticket sixty dollars for sixty days and you could get as far as you could go as long as you kept it within sixty days so I made this pilgrimage to Harvard, to Cambridge. And, and where uh, was your starting point? Well, I started at Berkeley, 
And I went first down to Louisiana, Hammond, Louisiana, and visited some friends of mine who owned a leather shop, a hippie leather shop, a wonderful bunch of people running a leather shop in this totally redneck town. Why did I go see them? Well, I went to see them because they lived out in the country where there were pastures and cattle. And <laughs> I went there basically to hunt for mushrooms. And, you know, and, and my idea in my, this is 1974, and my idea was, well, you know, I'll get a bunch of mushrooms and dry them, take them back to California and sell them. Well, it was like the worst season for mushrooms in like five years that they'd live there. So I went down there and I did find some mushrooms, but just a few, plenty for my own needs, but I didn't have grocery bags of them or anything like that. That was the first place I went was Hammond, Louisiana. And then I just got on the old bus and continued on. I stopped and saw, interestingly, this anthropologist in Maryland who had studied the Yanomami, one of the Amazonian tribes that uses these psychedelic snuffs. And he was a linguist. He was probably one of the few people in the world that actually spoke Yanomami. He had some interesting samples that he'd collected. I went there basically to pick up those samples and hang on with him. And then I continued up to Boston. And I had an old girlfriend who happened to live in Boston. So uh, and we were still on good terms. So so I went there. I had a place to stay. And then I went. I mean, I, I saw Schultes before I saw the girlfriend. I, I basically got off the bus and went immediately to the Botanical Museum. It was an incredible experience for me because I was like in total awe of this band. I mean, it was like, a, it was like an audience with the Pope or something, you know, <laughs> but he wasn't Pope like at all. He was just a very kindly down to earth, ordinary person. And he welcomed me and took me to lunch at the Harvard faculty club. And, and we talked about what I could work on and what would you like to do was the way the conversation started out. So because Terrence and I had, been to Colombia in 1971, and one of the things we were looking for was this ukuhe, this orally active varola preparation, which eventually ended up being one of the foci of my doctoral work, but that was 10 years in the future. But I was interested in varola. I was interested in those snuffs. And he said, well, you could go to the Amazon and study varola and sort out the chemistry of it. So he said, that would be a possibility. I totally, you know, appreciate that, endorse that. He said, well, there are two things you need to do before you do that. And I had my degree. I got my undergraduate degree in 1973. But he said, you need more chemistry, and you need to take more organic chemistry, and you need to take more taxonomy, you know, which you know as plant classification, the classic approach to plant classification. So... I said, yes, sir, absolutely. And, <laughs> you know, I got the message. I got back on the bus. I went back to Berkeley and I moved back to Colorado, where I'm from. Even though I had my bachelor's degree, I just enrolled in a couple of courses of advanced organic chemistry and the taxonomy specialty I chose to look in was grass systematics, which was like torture. Grass <laughs> systematic classification is the most arcane, difficult thing you could do. I must have had something about wanting to punish myself, but I studied grass systematics and organic chemistry. And an interesting, unexpected delight in this was that the person that was the chemistry teacher of this organic chemistry course, a man named Frank Sturmitz, turns out he was quite a well-known alkaloid chemist. He used to illustrate his lectures with, well, so here's LSD. Here's how you make LSD. Here's how the fungus makes LSD. And he was a, a brilliant guy and another mentor. And he was said, well, don't go work for Schultes. Go work for Norman Farnsworth in Chicago. 
And I said, no, no, you don't understand. Schultes is God. <laughs> you know? And so Schultes encouraged me to apply. And I was getting these courses that he thought I really needed to have on my transcripts. And I applied and I didn't get in. You know, I did not get accepted into Harvard, which was kind of a crushing blow, but not unexpected. It was a blessing in disguise in some ways, because while all this was going on, I was living in Fort Collins, Colorado, going to Colorado State. My friend, Larry Beasley, was an old friend from high school, and he was a horticulturalist. And as it turned out, he was running the greenhouse at Colorado State University when I moved there. So I had access to the greenhouse and brought in some ayahuasca cuttings that we had from California. And also I had access to a sterile culture lab. They were doing tissue culture there, which can also be adapted to doing fungal culture. And I was messing around with ways to try to figure out how to grow the psilocybe cubensis. And I had access to a university lab to do this work in which was amazing. And we tried a few things and actually succeeded in growing mushrooms out of these mason jars on sterilized substrates. You're probably familiar with the book Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide, which Terry and I published under pseudonyms. One of your great contributions to humankind. Maybe the most significant contribution, but that was the method that we developed there. And in the process of growing the mushrooms and then sampling the mushrooms and and just getting excited about being able to grow mushrooms, I thought, wow, well, maybe I'll change my focus from varola to psilocybin mushrooms. And I wrote to Schultes about this, and I said, what would you think of that? And he wrote back a rather kind of stuffy letter, <laughs> you know, saying, well, I... My specialty is higher plants. And I think if you want to work on fungi, you should talk to Dr. Alexander H. Smith at the University of Michigan. But basically saying, I mean, the subtext was you're a traitor. (laughs) How dare you? (laughs) Yeah, not really. I mean, he was, uh, there there was subsequent encounters, but he, he basically said, if you want to study Amazonian plants, I'm all in. I'd, I'd be happy to have you. And as it turned out, I didn't get accepted, so that opportunity was taken away. But the unexpected benefit of this was that some years later, well, this was 74, so after that, I did my master's at the University of Hawaii, not studying psychoactive plants. My plot to study psychoactive plants there was undermined. But I ended up applying to the University of British Columbia, and I started there in 1979. And my supervisor there was a man named Neil Towers, also kind of a giant in this field, not as gigantic as Schultes, but very much known in the world of phytochemistry and ethnobotany and so on. And he was quite open to me working on mushrooms. I actually started out in his program because he had come to Hawaii while I was a graduate student there. And my supervisor in Hawaii was another one of these incredible mentors that I've been blessed with throughout my academic career, Sandy Siegel. And Dr. Siegel, whenever anybody came to visit, a visiting professor or dignitary, he would always invite the graduate students up to his house. We'd sit around and have pizza and beer and shoot the breeze with the whatever luminary was in town. And Dr. Towers was one of the luminaries. In the process of having this conversation, he said, well, I've got this uh, young master student working on the psilocybes, working on the enzyme that converts psilocybin to psilocin, the phosphatase. And she's not getting very far with it, but it's a very interesting project and wish there was somebody to kind of continue that work, you know, and I practically spit my beer out and I said, hmm, well, Dr. Pat Howard, I've had some interest in this. And what do you think about 
letting me do it. And, you know, what do you think about taking me on? And I said, well, yeah, if you're interested, that's a possibility. So we started corresponding. And I was like midway through my master's thesis in Hawaii at that point. And we started corresponding and I got accepted. And I got, with Dr. Tower's support, I actually got a four-year graduate fellowship And I started working on psilocybe and the idea, and I had developed the technique for growing them. Dennis, may I pause for just one second? Certainly. I'm Uh, getting off on many tangents. Oh, no, I love all the tangents. That is actually kind of the, if there's any theme to this show, it it is embracing tangents. But I want to just mention a few things and uh, ask a couple of questions, but I want you to bookmark that. So we're Sure. Uh, we're, we're in Canada or headed to Canada at that point, but I just want to mention a few things. So is it true that when you first met Schultes, when you walked in, he was effectively hugging an air conditioner? And the reason I ask is that if you look at photographs of Schultes in his prime, it very much evokes an Indiana Jones, minus the tomb rating, of course. Mm-hmm resilience and durability. I mean, you see him in native dress, you see him right. really fully engaged as a, not just an observer, but as a participant. He spent more than a decade, as, as I understand it. So About scouting. 15 years. 15 years in the Amazon. And this is not mm-hmm. flying first class <laughs> no, <laughs> to, no. to the Amazon. <laughs> no. <laughs> so your first exposure to him was him hugging an air conditioner, as I understand it. Yeah, well, he was obviously a little past his prime at that point. But when I took this bus and got off the bus, it was like a early September. It was a sweltering summer. And I got off the bus and I took my backpack. I must have looked a mess. I mean, I'd been literally on the bus for four days, you know. (laughs) But I got to his office and I went to the desk downstairs. I said, I'm here to see Dr. Schultes. They said, oh, he's upstairs in his office. So I went upstairs and couldn't see anybody there. There was nobody at the reception desk. And I sort of peered in this dark room with all the blinds closed. And wiping the sweat from my brow. I mean, then I could see him back in the back of this office laboratory that he had there, and he was hugging the air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you have an AC, you, you, better, you might as well use it, I suppose. Well, otherwise, well yeah, why I there? figure, and I, I, I mean, it was like utterly charming, you know, because I expected this <laughs> swashbuckling, like you say, Indiana Jones, you know, tough guy, and he was all those things, but you got an air conditioner, you may as well hug it. Might so that's, that's what he did. <laughs> yeah. It was very disarming. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Let me let me also pick up on a couple of other points and ask just a couple of definitions for people listening, which we'll get to in a minute. But I would like to read a few things from the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, if you're willing to bear with me, because sure. I think it will hopefully help tie some things together in the minds of those who are not familiar with your background and your work. So Sanford Siegel, who you mentioned, so his mm-hmm. research interests, among many other things, included exobiology. But I want to read just a paragraph about him from your book, and then three sections that I pulled out about science. It's going to take me a minute, but if you could bear with me. Okay. So, so this is from the book, and on Sanford Siegel, this is where the excerpt begins, quote, in his NASA-funded work, he was extremely creative in his thinking about stress physiology in extreme environments. For example, he wondered what would happen if he tried to grow a cactus underwater. Turns out it grows fine as long as you bubble oxygen and carbon dioxide through the water. How well does a tarantula survive under a radiation flux similar to that at a Martian surface? It survives just fine for months. Can you germinate onion seedlings and liquid ammonia as a substitute for water? Yes, ammonia can substitute for water in many biological processes. He had a genius for thinking up these incredibly creative, exciting, and simple experiments. And yet they all had a rationale and a reason behind them. He was an out-of-the-box thinker. And then I'm going to jump to what you said separately in the book about science. Quote, I knew scientific thought had its limits, but before we could reject science, the most powerful set of intellectual tools ever developed by the human mind, we first had to learn how to do science. Then, if we still wanted to reject it, we could do so as scientists with full knowledge of what it was we were rejecting. I think these these really, really 
important to tie together because you have such broad exposure. And as I understand it, there were many influences early on, two of which were, I believe it was the Yaqui way of knowledge by Carlos Castaneda, even though subsequently a lot of people, and you're aware mm -hmm. of this, came to conclude that a lot of that, if not most of it, was fictionalized. And a book that I have about 20 feet from here, which is the first edition of something you already mentioned, the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. ESPD. And right. that was from 1967. I have the updated, I shouldn't say updated, but a second volume from 2017, which you organized, which was a 50th anniversary. Right. Could, could you speak to perhaps the, the appeal of science? Because what I've noticed in the, let's call it the psychedelic ecosystem, is that you have purists in many different silos, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason I, I've been so excited to spend time with you is because you have been a, a boundary walker of sorts across these different silos. What is it that drew you most to science and the scientific method in addition to some of the facets perhaps represented by Castaneda's work in some respect? I think the 1967, 1968 were like pivotal years for me in terms of my discovery of my professional direction and my professional interests, as well as being psychedelics. These are also very personal things. But that year, 1968, is the year that these two books came across my desk The Teachings of Don Juan, the first edition that my brother gave me for my 18th birthday. And then the ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs, which I am not even sure, I don't even remember where I originally got the first edition, but that had come across my radar a few months earlier. And these two books were very important for me in terms of framing my interests. It made me aware that there was this ethnographic background of these traditional backgrounds, even though we probably, most people agree that Castaneda made a lot of this stuff up, didn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It made it clear that there was a body of traditional knowledge around the use of these things, whether what he described was accurate or not, didn't matter. That was one page, one side of the frame. And then the ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs made me aware that a lot of this was about chemistry and plants and pharmacology and molecules and, and you know, a more hard science, biologically oriented aspect to it. So these two things seem to fit together very well. And I thought, ethnopharmacology is a real thing, you know, at least to the extent that this book exists, it's a real thing. And could you define ethnopharmacology? Ethnopharmacology, there's various definitions of it. The one I like is kind of tortured. It's kind of long, <laughs> but, but I'll explain why I like it. So ethnopharmacology is the interdisciplinary, by definition, interdisciplinary scientific investigation of biologically active substances used or observed by humans in traditional societies. And the reason it's so tortured is it's not always about plants. It's not always about medicinal plants. It's not always about things that humans ingest. For example, arrow poisons, totally legitimate kind of subject for ethnopharmacology. And then traditional societies kind of limits the scope. We're talking about not, I mean, in some sense, all of pharmacology is ethnopharmacology because it's people doing it, you know, but we're talking about traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and that sort of thing. That's the formal definition of ethnopharmacology that I like. And I think it's also worth highlighting for folks, and you would have, I'm sure, dozens or hundreds of examples how many commonly used compounds or drugs have come out of, in some form, ethnopharmacology, whether it be aspirin or you mentioned dart poisons that, you know, curare leading then into anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And the list just goes on and on and on. There's so many things that we take for granted 
right. that have their origins in these places. The whole spectrum, really, of when you're talking about natural products, especially for things like CNS active natural products and so on, they come out of a cultural context. We know about these things because they have a cultural context. And if you look at even just herbal medicines, herbal remedies, every one of these things that you can buy in the in the drugstore or the health food store has a story behind it, has a cultural backstory. And then entrepreneurial forces and commercial forces take that and develop products out of it. For example, Kava Kava is a good example of that. I mean, it's now a supplement and you can buy it in health food stores. It's a very useful muscle relaxant and sort of tranquilizer, but it comes out of the context of Polynesia and traditional medicine. Many, many things are that way. So there's always a cultural backstory. That's what I like about ethnopharmacology. It ties those kinds of things together with the nuts and bolts side of it. What are the active ingredients? What's the chemistry? What's the pharmacology? So on. If you don't mind, and I know this is a bit stochastic, but I would love to jump into this volume, the 50th anniversary volume of the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. And just as background, and please correct me if I get any of this wrong, but the the 1967 gathering was subsidized by the U.S. government. I think it was the, was it the NIMH? NIMH, that's right. National Institute of Mental Health. And so you had this gathering of titans of sorts to discuss exactly as the title would imply, the ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs, after which a volume was produced, printed and sold by the U.S. government, which included mm -hmm. the findings. And suffice to say, shortly thereafter, you have the Nixon administration, the Controlled Substances Act, and game over. Right. <laughs> so, and then you organized this 50th anniversary. And just to give people an idea of the contents, and also I want to tell people, if you are interested in the science, this is published by Synergetic Press. You can find it on the Synergetic Press website as well as on Amazon. This is a beautifully produced double volume where you have the original 1967 and then the 2017 edition. The contents are just fascinating. And one of them that I'd love to dig into, and it doesn't necessarily have to, our discussion doesn't have to be reflective exclusively of the content in this, Broad Spectrum Roles of Harmine and Ayahuasca by Dale Millard. Could you speak to some of the more recent findings related to ayahuasca, which could include this discussion of harmine? But I think a lot of folks have assumed that ayahuasca is this psychedelic brew principally containing Banister epsis copy of this vine and a plant source containing DMT like chacruna or mm -hmm. other psychotria veritas that the the vine really just serves to render the DMT orally absorbable or active but it seems like there's a lot more to the story it does do that. It, it, yeah. it does do that. It's the MAO inhibitor, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, that renders the, the DMT containing the admixture plants active because DMT itself, as you know, is not orally active if you just take it pure or if you make a tea of chacruna, one of these, and then drink it by itself. Nothing's going to happen unless you have an yeah. MAO inhibitor on board. But it turns out that alkaloids of Banisteriopsis, these beta carbolines, are much more than just MAO inhibitors. For example, one of the primary alkaloids in, in ayahuasca is harmine. And harmine is a strong MAO inhibitor, but it also stimulates neurogenesis, which is nerve growth. And these are recent findings. Another constituent in ayahuasca is a related alkaloid called tetrahydroharmine, which is an MAO inhibitor, but also a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it has like SSRI type activity and also some other unexpected things. For one thing, and this was came out of our wasca study in Brazil, it has long-term effects on the levels of the serotonin transporters in the brain. The, the mm. serotonin transporters are the presynaptic molecules that take serotonin back up out of the synapse and 
recycles it and re-releases it. Well, like SSRIs, tetrahydroharmine inhibits that, but it also causes a long-term elevation in the levels of these serotonin transporters. And that was a unique finding. We didn't know what to expect, but that came out of the study. And it was kind of surprising. But then when we found this effect, you know, this is all done. This is all in vitro. We took tissue samples, uh, platelet samples, and so on. And this was all done in the lab. But we found this persistent elevating effect on the serotonin transporters. We thought, what does that mean? wasn't really clear. We were asking a naive question. Is there anything biochemical that makes regular ayahuasca drinkers different biochemically than normal people or other people? And this was one clear difference. We didn't really know what it meant. But then we looked into the literature and we found out there were a number of pathologies that were associated with abnormal deficits in the serotonin transporters. For example, various kinds of alcoholism, addiction, suicidality, even homicidal behavior, various kinds of behavioral pathologies, which happen to be the very pathologies that many of the people in our UDV study were saying ayahuasca had saved them, usually from alcoholism. That was usually their problem. And if they stayed in the church, in the supportive context, and drank ayahuasca regularly, then they stayed on track. And many they were on track. These were very behaviorally, psychologically functional people, not sick. If they were sick, they were cured, and they attributed it to ayahuasca. And then in our in vitro studies, in a couple of vial assays, we found that it was really tetrahydroharmine that was having this effect. And the course of action was over about two weeks. And my friend, Jace Calloway, who was one of the investigators on this and figured out how to do it, he had access to brain imaging technology at his laboratory in in Finland. He was doing postdocs in, in Finland. So he tried taking tetrahydrohormine himself and imaging himself and showed, well, sure enough, it did raise the levels of these serotonin transporters on about a two-week cycle. And then if you stop taking it, it went back down to baseline. So does that mean on the two-week cycle that after one administration, the levels remained elevated for two weeks or that it required two weeks of administration to elevate? It required about two weeks of continuous administration. Mm. to bring it to that level. And that's kind of, that was the cycle that the UDV, customarily, they took it every couple of weeks. Not that they knew about this effect, but that was just their practice. Well, I guess they knew about, in a sense, they indirectly knew about the effect, but not the mechanism, right? That's right. That's that's uh, right. And for for people who don't know, UDV, I'm probably going to mispronounce it, but that's the Unyaldo Vegetal, something like that. One of the syncretic churches founded in Brazil. Yeah, I should have explained that. One of the syncretic churches, the group that invited us in to do this biomedical study in the early 90s, that was one of the chief findings. Just a quick thanks to one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back to the show. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront. Did you know if you missed 10 of the best performing days after the 2008 crisis, you would have missed out on 50%, 50% of your returns. Don't miss out on the best days in the market. Stay invested in a long-term automated investment portfolio. Wealthfront pioneered the automated investing movement, sometimes referred to as robo-advising, and they currently oversee $20 billion of assets for their clients. Wealthfront can help you diversify your portfolio, minimize fees, and lower your taxes. It takes about three minutes to sign up, and then Wealthfront will build you a globally diversified portfolio of ETFs based on your risk appetite and manage it for you at an incredibly low cost. Wealthfront software constantly monitors your portfolio day in and day out, so you don't have to. They look for opportunities to rebalance and tax loss harvest to lower the amount of taxes you pay on your investment gains. Their newest service is called Autopilot, and it can monitor any checking account for excess cash to move into savings or an investment account. They've really thought of a ton. They've checked a lot of boxes. Smart investing should not feel like a roller coaster ride. Let the professionals do the work for you. 
Go to Wealthfront.com slash Tim and open a Wealthfront investment account today, and you'll get your first $5,000 managed for free for life. That's Wealthfront.com slash Tim. Wealthfront will automate your investments for the long term, and you can get started today at Wealthfront.com slash Tim. Does the UDV differentiate between different types of brews for different purposes? My understanding is that these some of the daimistas or some of the members or perhaps groups within Santo Daimi, another one of these syncretic churches, do have different, I don't want to say admixtures, but concentrations of different things and different brews for different purposes. Are you aware of, of that existing in, within the UDV? Yes, yes. The UDV does have that. They do have different formulations and so on, and they don't talk about them. I mean, yeah. we were not able to get any information out of them about that other than the fact that, yes, we do have these different formulations. I mean, we came up against a couple of interesting things about when we were dealing with the UDV, which was that they were very concerned that ayahuasca or ayahuasca, as they called it, be viewed as a sacrament, not right. as a medicine. You know, and so if you want much less to, as a drug, right? That would be a big problem. much less a drug. They didn't like the idea that you would study it as a drug. They were totally open to doing this biomedical study, but as far as going the next step and looking into mechanisms and, and that sort of thing, they were kind of conflicted about that. They could see the value of it, but then they didn't like the idea of godless science delving into their central mystery sacrament you know and i could understand that but as a result of that we we lost some opportunities to do some interesting things totally i wonder if that would be different now because my understanding i think i got this from the book is that or maybe it was from different reading that I did of yours, that part of the reason for their cooperation was politically sort of legally motivated in the sense that they wanted the local slash national government and potential policymakers to view this as beneficial. And so they were yes. open to showing the benefits, but they didn't want reductionist science to, as you put it, remove the mystery by explaining some secular mechanism of action. Yeah, there was definitely a political aspect to this, that this is a big reason why they wanted this work to be done by outside investigators who presumably would, you know, if, if, if it was just UDV and there were scientists in the, in the UDV, it was a middle to upper class demographic segments, but they wanted people from the outside to be the chief investigators to avoid the perception that the work would be biased. And that's one reason I got invited. And Charlie Grobe was the chief principal investigator. I invited him to do that, and he became that. So they wanted this regulatory agency called CONFIN, kind of a combination of the DEA and the FDA. They wanted to present data to CONFIN that showed that this was not a public health menace or danger, and also that it was beneficial or potentially beneficial. So there was definitely a, a political sub-agenda here. But as it turned out, I mean, we just did the science, and the science supported that it was beneficial. Almost all of our subjects that joined the UDV in a state of life crisis, and they felt like the medicine, the tea, as they called it, and the very supportive context of the UDV, they said that's equally necessary, but they felt like that was a vessel for redemption, essentially, and turning their lives around. And it's a complex thing. It's a complicated matter. I'm endlessly fascinated by the uh, the syncretic churches that use ayahuasca as a sacrament. I think there's so much that could be learned when you have these relatively large groups consuming twice per month. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just an incredible opportunity. Mm -hmm. Question for you around ayahuasca, because I think in the 
we've already alluded to this, but in the minds of some, ayahuasca is one thing, right? It's like a, it's like an old fashioned that is always made the same way, but there are right. many different cocktails that could be called ayahuasca. And in the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, you talk very briefly about, and I'm not sure if you called this in the book, but Chagropanga, which is also, I think it's a Diploteris Cabrerana. Is that how that's pronounced? Mm -hmm. Diploteris. Really Diploteris. Diploteris. Oh, so yeah. many words I only read. I never hear them Close said. enough. Close <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> which by some, like the, the Awahun is called Yahe, and it's a different plant from the chakron. Did, did you ever have the opportunity to consume ayahuasca with the chakropanga? Yes, yes, yeah. Experientially, uh, did you find it to be different? Well, I only consumed it a few times. I found it to be a shorter acting, and you know, in terms of the visionary stage of the experience, and also more intense. So there's something pharmacokinetically going on there with the absorption of it. But people are mistaken if they think ayahuasca is one thing. Ayahuasca is a very complex, in the cultural context, it's a very complex thing. There are many varieties of ayahuasca, the vine. There are then all these admixture plants, some of which contain DMT and varieties of those. And then a whole pharmacopoeia of other admixture plants that are more or less associated with ayahuasca. They're part of the Dietis, which is a common practice in the Amazon. You learn about the properties of other medicinal plants by taking them, and then you take ayahuasca, either in combination or after you take them, and you learn about their properties from the visions that ayahuasca gives you about their... So ayahuasca is like the pipeline to plant wisdom in a certain way, to tap into this, I don't know what you might call it, guy in mind that's represented by these many admixture plants. So there's a whole lot of work left to be done with ayahuasca and looking into more depth than we were able to look at at that time. That's one of the projects that we're trying to get off the ground with the McKenna Academy. We want to do a very extensive phytochemical an ethnobotanical survey of, of different ayahuasca brews, document their preparation, document the plants that go into them, and then follow that up with bioassays and, and just get a better handle on the varieties of these different brews and their uses. Why would we care? Why do we want to do this? Well, it's gathering knowledge, it's gathering information, but the potential practical outcome of this is that you can formulate brews that might be specific for different types of disorders. You know, maybe some work better for addiction, some work better for trauma, some work better for depression or that sort of thing. All of this is kind of supported by the fork knowledge, but there's been nothing like a controlled study of any of this. It's very hard to get funding to study ayahuasca in a clinical setting because it's not a pure compound. It doesn't lend itself to the same kind of double-blind placebo control protocols that you can use with something like psilocybin. Yeah, it's complicated. It is very, very very seems very complex. Uh, I'd love to ask you about one particular plant, which well, it's hard to tell them apart sometimes because it depends on the <laughs> the orientation. Uh, you know, it could be datura metal or could be brugmansia. I want to ask you about brugmansia, uh, also called floripondi or toy. Do you think there's a place for that? It scares the hell out of me, and I know it's uh, sometimes used. But what what is your position, if any, on on Burgmansia. Well, first of all, you're right to be scared. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is a very dangerous plant. It is not only toxic, but it produces a kind of delirium. It's not a psychedelic. I sometimes say in my lectures, it's a true hallucinogen, but not psychedelic. By that, I mean psychedelics, you see hallucinations sometimes behind the eyes or whatever, you usually know that these things are hallucinations. With Brugmansia, which used to be called, the genus is very close to Datura. In fact, they used to be classified as Daturas. 
But Detura, the experiences that you have, you see hallucinations and you cannot tell if they're real or not. And so it, in that sense, it's a true hallucinogen, but it's not psychedelic. And it is, it produces a state of profound disorientation and delirium, essentially. So it's used very badly. It's used as a date rape drug and things like that in Brazil and Colombia. And it's often associated with brujeria in the ayahuasca tradition. In other words, black magic, sorcery. And if you take a brew of ayahuasca that contains datura or brigmansia, you can tell because it causes this dry mouth sensation which is typical of these anticholinergics like like Tatura. Is that the like the scopolamine? Exactly. So it's, yeah. it's scopolamine. So you can tell, and if you're taking ayahuasca that's got toe is the traditional word for, for these things, toe, T-O-E accent, that's a good sign that you're dealing with a brujo, and that's a good sign that you should get the hell out of there, you know, because they <laughs> yeah. do not have your best interests at heart, and or unlikely to. That said, uh, you have to acknowledge that it has a place in in this whole ayahuasca complex, and there may be people that can practitioners that can use it beneficially, but my own experiences with Datura, which you probably read about in the book, yeah. you know, that scared me away. I mean, Horrifying. I had yeah. no idea what I was getting into. And I was, we were very lucky. We could have killed ourselves. <laughs> yeah, there are documented, lots of documented fatalities with both of those. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, I wanted to mention, to bring that up just because there are risks associated with a lot of these things. Yeah documented fatalities with tobacco over ingestion tobacco juice in the amazon i uh, mm-hmm. you have to be really really careful and you know i want to come back to a second uh, to this kind of hired gun aspect i think as you put it <laughs> uh, in the book in the world of vegetalismo and in this let's just call it the medicine world in south america it it's not the case that everyone is focused it's actually rarely the case that practitioners are exclusively focused on how we perhaps view these medicines in North America for healing, for the contending with and processing of trauma. The cosmovision and the use case is much, much broader. And I just want to mention one more thing, which is even if you don't believe in black magic or anything like that, you can believe in manipulation. And the Brugmansia, like you mentioned, in Colombia is one example and elsewhere. Although I think that people are kind of hip to this and law enforcement is hip to it. So perhaps the use has declined, but it was very common that crime syndicates would take the Brugmansia extract or somehow purify the scopolamine. Then they would have prostitutes or other people blow the powder into the faces of victims Mm -hmm. And this is this is the crazy part uh, just that I want to highlight for folks that after which sometimes these victims would be brought to their own home. They would help the perpetrators load everything in their house into a loading van and they would appear totally normal to say the doorman and so on. Mm-hmm. And 12 hours later have no recollection of what they did. I mean, right. it's, it's wild. I mean, it brings up kind of these visions of the serpent and the rainbow. Like these are, these, it's, it's, it's crazy to think about. It, it is. They appear totally normal, except that they're helping load all the furniture into the elevator at three in the morning. You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to yeah. Be, yeah. Uh, I think it was Vice dot com that Vice did a this, good a good piece on this. They did a good thing. Yeah. So so that's the thing. The the Detura the Brickmansia confuses you and makes you extremely suggestible. So you get this stuff inside you and then people say well let's go to your apartment and take out all the furniture let's go to your atm and take out all your money and you say oh well that sounds like a good idea let's go do that (laughs) (laughs) so black magic aside it can definitely doesn't have to be magic it just puts you in such a state of confusion 
susceptibility, suggestibility, that's the way it works. It really is so fascinating and simultaneously sometimes terrifying to go really deep into the rabbit hole with this. Could you speak to traditional use of plant medicine and ayahuasca? And, you know, I'm hearkening back to the mention of the sort of non-inherent good nature of practitioners or ayahuasca and the non-inherently bad nature, sort of this neutral <laughs> available for higher aspect in some instances that I think a lot of people are not aware of. Could you sort of speak to to that a bit? There are brujos. There are people who don't really have your best interests at heart. And there are other people, other practitioners who really are amazing healers and they For can sure. help a great deal of people. But the thing is that the context of traditional use has changed due to outside cultural influences because like anything else the people want to give the extra heroes the ayahuasca tourists or whatever they want to give them their money's worth and so the nature of the ceremonies changes has changed in response to this i mean back in the day before there was anything like when ayahuasca usage was still kind of a, a tribal based tradition there wasn't all this outside influence it was the shaman who took ayahuasca not the people rarely would the ayahuasca be given to a person that came to the ceremony unless there was some specific illness or something they wanted specifically to be treated but it was the ayahuascaro who had the visions that downloaded the information about the plants and other kinds of practices they might engage in to help people with healing. Well, that's all changed. The outside influence of the global culture, I mean, people are not going to go to South America and spend all this money to sit and watch somebody take ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they are there to have the experience, and that's okay. I think it's just fascinating what we're seeing go on now with the ayahuasca tourism thing is definitely a complex thing. It's not necessarily a completely bad thing or a completely good thing. It's it's a mixed bag because many people are helped by this and all the tourists coming down, they bring economic benefits to these communities, but then those are not equitably distributed. You get a situation where the local ayahuasquero, who used to be just some guy or some gal that was a person in the village who kind of did this work on the side and they had their own livelihood, farming, fishing or whatever. Well, now these people are kind of superstars and they get a lot of income. It generates a lot of jealousy within the community where that can happen. They also get priced out of the local market, right? They so. get priced, exactly. They get priced out of the local market. There is uh pressure on the resource base uh, ayahuasca and the admixture plants are being over harvested and there's not enough effort being made to really make sure the sources are sustainable but that's changing the market is adjusting to this but these these changes take place over they take years and there are some very hopeful trends now people are becoming more aware of some of the issues with over harvesting and so on let me pull another paragraph here and then uh, i want to ask you a question about some of your personal experiences and this is related to the science that was brought up earlier there are many <laughs> things in heaven and earth that are beyond the ken of science and may remain so forever anyone who has taken psychedelics seriously or has had other transcendent experiences is likely to share that conclusion at the same time science remains the most effective method for asking questions of nature and getting back answers that can be tested and validated so you you fascinate me on so many different levels and i've actually read much more of your writing than i have read the writing of your brother and Part of the Venn diagram that makes you such a subjective interest to me <laughs> is the, the scientific, let's call it the esoteric, and then the personal. And I've heard in other interviews you talk about, when prompted, you don't just volunteer this, but when people ask about the number of sessions you have done with, let's say, ayahuasca, it seems to number 
even though you don't keep track in the 500 plus oh, I'd say so. range, something yeah. in that range. And as far as I know, you are not a member of one of the syncretic churches nope. uh, where people would drink twice a month. So people can do the math. If someone does that for decades, it adds up. Yeah. I would love for you to speak to, because many people will hear that and they'll say, well, wait a second, you do it once, it changes your life. And then you're kind of done. Why on earth would you ever do it so many times? And I would just love to hear you speak to that. Partly it's because of the context in which I have used ayahuasca and brought other people to South America to have these experiences. I've organized retreats and that sort of thing. So I'm one of those, I'm guilty. If you want to point at the people that have fostered ayahuasca tourism, I've certainly contributed to that. I'm a little conflicted about it. So when I do these retreats, then I drink. People expect me to drink, and I do drink. The other reason is, I think every time you take it, maybe this is the more valid reason, every time that you take it, or most times that you take it, not every time you take ayahuasca is going to be a peak experience. I mean, there's lots of times when it's disappointing and you just get sick and the brew is bad or whatever. But it has a lot to teach us. There's a lot to learn from ayahuasca. And even though you've taken it multiple times, you still keep getting new insights or new I mean, the experience seems worthwhile, and so I keep taking it. Maybe I'm thick-skulled. Maybe I, <laughs> maybe other people have an easier way to assimilate the lesson and say, yeah, I got the message, okay, I don't need to do this anymore. I've come close to that a couple of times, but I think Ram Dass was the, famously said, or maybe it was Alan Watts, I'm not sure, who said, once you get the message, hang up the phone. Right. And I sort of think I disagree with that. I think, in other words, the message is not the same every time. There is no standard message. And this is a dynamic interaction with with the plants that you're learning from. Indigenous people talk about plant teachers. And you can get into the weeds about whether that's a valid concept. Are they really intelligent? Are they not? The point is, it doesn't really matter whether the plants, the ayahuasca opens up some part of yourself that may present as something not the self, but that knows things, has information to transfer. It doesn't really matter. What I say is the information good. So every time you take it or when you take it, there's really a bottomless well of things to still be thought about and and assimilated and so on. So I kind of don't believe in the hang up the phone approach. My approach would be, I guess, keep listening. Keep listening because a lot of what you might hear will be stuff that you've heard before, but there may be new things that come along that make it worth it to stay engaged. And so that's how I relate to it. It's not a waste of time to keep listening. And you've also noted that, and there, you're not the only person, uh, Luis Eduardo Luna and others have, have also noted that these habitual consumers of ayahuasca often seem to remain exceptionally sharp and lucid into older age. And mm-hmm. as I've thought about this and spoken with people who have a lot of experience like yourself, it seems like there are kind of different frames through which you can look at this experience. One is almost like the replacement of a malfunctioning hip. So you have a hip replacement, it's one and mm-hmm. done, maybe you need it again 10 years later, but that's mm-hmm. that's it, that's the hang up the phone approach. And then there there's this way of looking at it almost like going to the gym. There are all these use cases historically that seem to at least offer other use cases, like the use of ayahuasca for hunting, let's just say. Right. And you know, another one that kind of occurred to me as I talked to some of these folks who drink you know, in South America, some, some people are drinking four or five, six times a week. And it's almost like you could, let's say, live in New York and go to Japan and study things in Japan in the hopes that you can bring it back to New York and apply it in your life in New York. 
But you could also mm-hmm. go to Japan and just get to know Japan and the culture mm-hmm. and how to operate in that space. And I'd love to hear you speak to outside of the groups that you bring down where, where you are expected to drink. How do you decide when to drink? Well, just usually the occasion presents itself. It's rare that I would come to one of these places and not drink or just when it seems appropriate is when I decide. And if I'm in a situation where ayahuasca is being drunk, then I would probably drink it. And I tend not to go after it outside of a ceremonial context. And even for a while, I would say, well, I don't even drink it in the States or Canada. I just confine it to South America when I'm down there. But then I can't really stick to that because there are opportunities here. And now I go to a place called uh, Salterra in Costa Rica, which is one of the higher profile ayahuasca retreats. I'm, I'm an advisor to Salterra and I I like the way they're doing it. I think they're very ethical about in their approach to all this. And uh, so it's a matter of opportunity rather than anything else when it seems appropriate. But to your, what you alluded to before about how it can be, in, in some ways, ayahuasca and a lot of psychedelics can be a big reset, but then there is the maintenance part of it and the, the work we did with the UDV and the finding about the modulation of these serotonin transporters is really an eye-opener because it, what that speaks to is that regular use of ayahuasca can actually repair some of these deficits. In fact, it may be the only drug or medicine that can do that. I think peak experiences can be major reset moments, and I think this is part of the therapeutic profile of a lot of psychedelics. They basically get you out of your default mode network. They get you out of your personal reference frame. They let you look at situations from a slight remove, and you have insights as to your existential situation, whatever it might be. Not all psychedelic experiences, not all ayahuasca experiences are necessarily these peak experiences, you know, and they don't have to be. They can be beneficial and they can help you remember, maybe as a more accurate term, some of the insights you had from previous experiences. And then I think there's a physiological aspect too, particularly with ayahuasca, like this modulation of the serotonin transporters and so on. And neurogenesis, you mentioned that a lot of practitioners, ayahuasca girls, seem to be unusually sharp and lucid, even though they're maybe of advanced age. And I think that is a reflection of ayahuasca. I think that in general, I am kind of a skeptic about this whole microdosing fad. I have my doubts about it. But in the case of ayahuasca, I think microdosing might make sense, not for the hallucinogenic psychedelic effects, but for the things the beta carbolines do for your nervous system. You think of them as kind of a nerve tonic. And keeping the serotonin transporter levels elevated is probably a, a very good thing, guarding against depression and that kind of stuff. So again, just like with the plants and the chemistry, there's lots to be learned about the pharmacology of ayahuasca too. So, so I want to talk about the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. We're going to spend a, a good amount of time on that. Before we get there, though, since we're talking about some of the possible benefits of, in this case, ayahuasca, I, want, I would love to discuss perhaps the other side of the coin. And I know that the experiment at La Chorrera does not relate to ayahuasca specifically, but I'd like to and I know you've described this many, many times, so we don't have to spend a ton of airtime on it, but the I'm going to read a paragraph, actually two paragraphs, and then we can use that as a way of backing into it, if that's okay. Here's the prelude to the chapter that introduces the experiment at La Chorrera, which, again, we don't have to spend too much time on, but just enough to kind of frame this. In some respects, quote, in some respects, everything in life before we arrived at La Chorrera was a prelude to the events that engulfed us there, and everything afterwards has been a reflection of them. Terence chronicled the events in true hallucinations. 
Though his account may seem unlikely and bizarre, I believe it is largely accurate, even if interpretations vary as to what it all meant. I can't vouch for every detail, if only because, and this is the part that I'm just going to highlight here, I was lost in hyperspace for much of the time, or overwhelmed by psychosis, again, depending on interpretation. Anyone with an interest in the facts, in quotation marks, of our story, if the word even applies, should regard Terence's narrative as required reading. And then we flash forward to much later in the book. Quote, Terence mentions that on March 20th, we all celebrated at one of Bogota's finer restaurants and that the others agreed I was totally back, quote unquote. They weren't aware that, in my mind, I was in telepathic communications with all the waiters and that our dishes were being wafted to the table by telekinesis. Rather than alarm them, I kept that to myself. But except for a few episodes like that, I was doing all right. Okay. There's, there's a lot to discuss here. I have personally experienced many upsides to psychedelic use, including ayahuasca. I've also been put into hyperspace, as you put it, on a few occasions or have become, say, destabilized <laughs> if we mm -hmm. want to be a little less charitable. And I, I have friends who have become destabilized after dietas in some cases, using ayahuasca in other cases, in some cases from LSD. We don't have to go to South America for this, for right. weeks, months at a time. And I would love to just hear you perhaps expand a little bit on your personal experience and if you have had more experiences like this so that people can be aware that this is kind of one of the cards in the deck. It is one of the cards in the deck, and people should be aware that this is a possibility, which is one reason why it's important to have a strong ritual environment, a strong ritual context, and a ayahuasquero, a practitioner that kind of knows what they're doing, because they can keep you on track. and gets you out into hyperspace and gets you back. And that's kind of the whole essence of shamanism. I have not since La Churera had experiences that have kept me three sheets to the wind, if you will, for weeks at a time. It was not particularly pleasant. And, you know, I mean, at the time, I was, I was not concerned about getting back all those concepts have kind of evaporated, you know. <laughs> but after yeah. I did get back, and actually did get more restabilized and truly back in my body and in ordinary reality, on reflection, I realized what a dangerous place this was to be in, and that potentially it could have gone the opposite way, where I never did reintegrate. One of the reasons that I was able to reintegrate, I think, was because because of the circumstances at La Churera, the process had to play out. There were people in our group who said, this is totally out of control. We need to get these people out of here into a psychiatric facility and under treatment. And Terrence and I both completely resisted that. Because we understood what was going on. At least we thought we did. We were in communication with each other. And it was like, no, you just need to let this play out. And and I think that was the right thing. I mean, it was a, you know, I have a, a lecture I give, a talk I give. It was it a psychotic break, was a shamanic initiation, or was it an alien <laughs> encounter? Probably all three in a certain way, but it was closer to a shamanic initiation in a certain, not that I call myself a shaman, I'm not, but it's the shamanic initiation is where you get to explore these dimensions and then you get back out, you get back onto your mundane feet in 3D and ordinary reality and whatever that is. I'm kind of wandering here, but I, I think the point is because of the fact that it was able to play itself out from beginning to end, it was actually a very healing experience rather than being disorganized and incoherent for the rest of my life. Maybe some people say I am, but <laughs> I don't think so. But it was actually a healing experience, and I came back from it stronger. And I feel like I am, even though I've continued to take psychedelics ever since on occasion, 
I've never gone to that place again, and I'm kind of grateful for that. <laughs> and, you know, and I also feel that I'm basically a fairly stable person. Let me ask a couple of follow up questions because what, there are a few things that struck me in the book in describing this, and uh, people should pick up the book and and read all of it, including this chronicle. Only the Kindle version is available, as you know. They're, Which is perfect for me because yeah, then I can take... Hard copies or no yeah, more. Hard to come by. So I, I can take notes and then export my notes, which is my favorite thing in the world to do. So, right. uh, so, so I have you know I have my 189 highlights, and then I went through and I added three asterisks to the things I wanted to follow up on. That's a six-page document. So I'm, I'm fully nerded out when it comes to my digestion of this book. And uh, please fill in the details or fact check me on this. But one of the things that struck me, and this also seems to be a pattern across people who, and I don't want to characterize your experience this way, but those people who might come unmoored and stay adrift for longer periods of time, is there was a real density of consumption of psilocybe mushrooms mm -hmm. when you were there. And my understanding is you mm -hmm. guys had very little in terms of food, maybe some, <laughs> some instant noodles and rice. And you had this just almost ridiculous abundance of mushrooms due to these Cebu cattle who were who were down there. And so you just you started spicing up meals and so on, throwing yeah, in yeah. psychedelic mushrooms. Uh, so you had just a not only a high dose experience, and there's a lot more to it, of course, but you had a really high density of continuous consumption. Mm -hmm. Was that accurate? Is that fair to say? Yes, yes, yes. And so we never really, in this process, we never really did give ourselves a chance to get back to baseline, as you will, and look at, well, what's what's going on here now that we're unstoned? We were never unstoned. Most of what happened with the experiment at La Chirera, when we actually performed the experiment at La Chirera, was post-mushroom. We mm. weren't eating them anymore. Oh, that's right. That was about two weeks ago. But there later. were plenty of them in our system. Yeah. You know? So, and then, of course, on the night that we, that we did the experience, <laughs> we, we ate them. But yeah, mushrooms are tricky. Mushrooms are not necessarily to be trusted in a certain way because they can lead you into these delusional spaces. And as a, plant teacher well they're not plants but you know as a psychedelic teacher they're somewhat less trustworthy than ayahuasca I feel. <laughs> you know i mean you can get into these delusional spaces and it's something to be careful of yeah certainly not to be trifled with in yeah. the sense that you you, sh you should i think it's a good idea to respect mushrooms yeah. none of these things yeah. should be, are to be trifled with, with. Yeah. to follow up on that you know you mentioned letting things play out and how that was beneficial to you and your reintegration. And perhaps if you had been subjected at that point to a psychiatric intervention, that that could have been problematic for you. You know, this presents a dicey situation, I, I suppose, for people who might experience things in the sense that as a counterweight to that, I know one person, for instance, who, who went to Peru, did a traditional dieta where he was consuming something called chirixanango and mm -hmm. ayahuasca on alternating days. And he did this for quite a long period of time. And chirixanango I've seen in a number of cases now, people who've had psychotic breaks after sort of continuous administration. Not to say it's bad. I just think that mm -hmm. there, this is, this is a, an observed kind of phenomenon. And right. his family had to go down to South America. He thought he was God and convince mm -hmm. him that if he were God, the gift he could give would be getting on this thing that was made up in his mind called an airplane and coming back to the United States. But I suppose there's, there's a plausible argument to be made that he would have been sort of among the lost and maybe would not have come out by himself. So how do you think about when it is appropriate? And again, we're not giving medical advice. Everybody needs to talk to their medical professionals, but would there not be times when a psychiatric intervention would be called for? How do you think about that? There would definitely be times when a psychiatric intervention, I'm not saying that every time. For me, the fact that the experience could play itself out, what was allowed to play out was this process of integration. And integration is really important, as you know, to psychedelic experience and this process of getting back to 
some kind of baseline, but with that change perspective, with the benefit of having had this experience and changing that perspective and so on. But sometimes, I mean, this is why set and setting is so important. And when you take it in a inappropriate set and setting, then there's the potential to come up against what we call the real world, you know, society and its conventions and its expectations. I mean, for example, I could share with you the son of a very good friend of mine in Minnesota at about age 18, went with his, I don't know what his previous psychedelic experience had been, not not great, but a few low-level mushroom experiences and so on. But he decided with some of his friends to take a trip to New York City. This is like small town boys in the big city, you know, and just having a great time. They took a lot of mushrooms and he sort of descended into this delusional world. His friends said, well, we're going back to Minnesota. And he said, well, I'm staying here. What are you going to do, live on the streets? Yes. And he had this whole thing. Well, it didn't take very long for him to come up against New York's finest, <laughs> as you might say, because yeah. he was acting pretty strange. And he he got into a tussle with the cops and punched one in the face. Uh-oh. That was a big mistake. Next thing you know, he was in jail and being transferred to what is the huge psychiatric hospital there? Bedlam or something? Uh, like that. Bedlam, Bellevue, maybe? Bellevue. Maybe. Bellevue. Mm-hmm. The only reason that he was able to resolve it in some ways was that at this point I was getting involved. I was actually in Brazil as an ayahuasca retreat when all this was going on. But my friend called me and said, this has happened. Is there anybody in New York, a psychiatrist that could help him? And as it turned out, I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, Steve Ross (laughs) might be able to help him. And I called Steve. This is all done in by Skype, there was, you know, and I called Steve and I explained the situation and he said, well, as it turns out, I have admission privileges at Bellevue, which I had no idea that he did, but he went over there and was able to intervene on this young man's behalf and get him out of there. But the guy never did recover. He went back, he was on psychiatric meds and he was fairly functional when he was doing that, but he hated being on psychiatric meds. And it just, it was a tragedy in many ways. He never fully recovered. How old was he at this time? He was about 18 or 19. Did he have a family history of schizophrenia or anything like that? Potentially, yes. There was schizophrenia in his family. It was a very strange family situation. I mean, his mother was a devout evangelical Christian, and his father was uh, like a psychedelic cowboy. He grew his mushrooms in the basement and brewed his own ayahuasca and so on. And so it was a weird family situation, and it was very bad. I, yeah. I don't want to disclose too much, but oh, of course, of course. I mean, that's it's, very, it's very even, sad. It was, yeah, a very sad outcome. So this is a case of it's hard to predict, but apparently he had this family history of schizophrenia, and he was, and the mushrooms triggered this. So uh, this is why you have to approach it from an informed place. And hopefully with a practitioner, whether a therapist or a shaman or whatever, who can hold that space and modulate the outcome to take it on the streets of New York, (laughs) probably not a good idea, you know, especially if you're not from New York. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it it also just brings to mind that maybe it should be the four S's, right? You have screening, set, setting, and then support. Like you have a exactly. safety, you have a safety net in place before you get on the trapeze. You know, you That's have right. a therapist, That's right. somebody and, who's and actually supervising. Just, this was just approached by these young men in a very recreational way. And they were out to have a good time and uh, it was not good. 
Yeah, powerful compounds, and I mean, this applies sort of across the entire pharmacopoeia, right? I mean, SSRIs also can produce suicidal ideation in, in all sorts of states. So you, you just really, mm -hmm. it's a really good idea to have professional assistance and supervision with these things. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy because you bring so many different perspectives and lenses and also toolkits to bear on these discussions. I would just love to hear about this new nonprofit and why you started it. The new nonprofit, the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, which is www.mckenna.academy. Academy is the suffix of, of the website. And I wanted to create a, originally the idea that was it, that we would start this academy and that we would have a physical place in South America where we could do retreats, which we had been doing all along, and then conferences and different types of educational activities to explore natural philosophy. And, and a lot of it was the ideas that would be a modern mystery school modeled after Eleusis, or not modeled after it, but in that spirit, a place where people could come together and share ideas and marvel at the cosmos and marvel at existence and do what natural philosophers do, natural philosophy being the precursor of science, what science used to be before it became so quantitative and reductionist. Natural philosophy is the root of science, and it differs from science in that it admits that there are other ways of knowing rather than the reductionist way of knowing. That's valuable, but that's not the whole trick. This is the uh, limitation of science. Science can understand segments of reality, but small in small pieces, but it doesn't fit the whole picture together too well. So the academy is basically, I guess the modern analog would be something like Esala, a place where ideas and brilliant minds can come together and create dialogues. And of course, COVID changed our business model radically because we couldn't do these conferences and so on. So we've had to pivot and go online. And that's what we're doing now, just trying to create a, an online presence and continue our work. It's partly educational. It's partly research. We've got a project going on down in Peru right now. We're making a documentary about the current state of traditional medicine in the Amazon around Iquitos. And a lot of it is about this botanist that I've worked with for 40 years there, who's the curator of the herbarium at the university in Iquitos. And he's one of these people about which it said, when a medicine man dies, it's as though a library has burned down. Well, he's not a medicine man in the sense that he's not a healer, but he has tremendous knowledge of the Amazonian flora and the medicine properties of these plants, and he knows many, many healers in the community. So we're trying to document his knowledge, because even though he's a scientist, he doesn't write things down. So we're trying to, through videography, make a documentary about what he knows, and then hopefully that will attract funding. We have big plans for this project. We call it the Knowledge Preservation Project. The first aspect of it is to make a short, relatively short documentary about this gentleman whose name is Juan Ruiz, and then to develop over the long term, what we want to do is work with the herbarium there and digitize the herbarium and try to make it into a world-class resource for plant research of all kinds that would be centered at the university. So this is all described in our website, and that's probably our biggest project right now for which we're seeking support. Support. And so people can find that at McKenna.Academy. I encourage everybody to check it out. The, yes. There are five key departments. Tell me if this requires updating, but you have therapeutics, education, retreats, R&D, and media. Is that still an accurate reflection, or has that been modified? That's an accurate reflection, but then 
some of those things are kind of dormant at the moment, like the retreats. Due to COVID. Due to COVID. I mean, eventually we want to get back to that. Media, obviously, is an even bigger part of it because the internet is our teaching platform now. Therapeutics, again, not so much because they're usually associated with the retreats, but education for sure and R&D. This project that we're doing with this, with this gentleman at UNAP, the university there, is in the category of R&D. And the McKenna Academy is, is a public charity. Is that right? That in the sense that it's tax exempt as a 501c3? It is. It is. It's a 501c3 tax exempt organization chartered in the United States, even though I don't live in the United States anymore. I live close enough. I live in Canada now. But the, uh, the academy is uh, incorporated in California as a 501c3. And who is involved with the academy besides yourself? Are there any particular people who are? acting as, as advisors or research uh, collaborators? Oh, definitely. Yeah, we have a number of people that are associated with it. The woman who is the executive director, Christina Chaya, lives in Peru, and I've worked with her previously on organizing retreats. So she continues to work with me. We have very good people on our board, one gentleman with lots of experience in the financial industry. Another woman is a corporate lawyer. So we have that expertise. And then we have just a fantastic bunch of advisors, one of whom is Alexandre Tanu, who you know very well. And Wade Davis is an advisor. Paul Stamets is an advisor. So we have a number of high-profile people. Yeah, it was a strong, strong roster. Yeah, definitely. What types of projects would be on the short list of things that you would like to engage with and explore, assuming that you have the resources to do so? Well, a couple of things are on the plate. So we've got this kind of long-term project, this knowledge preservation project, which we're beginning to brand it as Biognosis. And that is... The focus right now is on the documentation part. But then the next phase, which will take much longer and cost a lot more money, is to focus on the herbarium there, of which Juan Ruiz is the curator of this herbarium. So that's a long-term project that we want to do. In the shorter term, we're working on developing an ethnobotany course in collaboration with the Organization for Tropical Studies in Costa Rica. And we're going to be offering that course this fall. And one of the people that is working on that is a guy named Michael Coe, who is an ethnobotanist. And I was on his committee. He got his degree at the University of Hawaii, and he studied cultural keystone species in the Amazon around Pucallpa, which is basically ayahuasca. He is going to be the main instructor in this course, which will be online. And then we're planning to do a virtual symposium, probably in August, on the stone date theory. <laughs> Indeed. And we're going to do that because one of Terence's books, The Food of the Gods, is being reprinted again. I'm actually doing an online event with Michael Pollan and the publisher, and we're doing a, essentially a podcast together, but then we're going to do a one-day symposium on the stone date theory and have some interesting speakers. I wrote a new foreword for it, which I'll be happy to share with you, and we're going to have this symposium because we're going to revisit this whole idea which actually, based on new discoveries, is more plausible than it was when Terence first proposed it. And that's what my forward is about, in part, is that we didn't know about the way that these psychedelics can create these hyper-connected neural architectures and neurogenesis and enhancing the connectivity in the neocortex and that sort of thing. And that was not known at the time Terence wrote the book. What was 
also not known was anything about epigenetics. And epigenetics provides an evolutionary mechanism by which these changes in neural architecture could be propagated through generations. And if you look at the environment that we now know from paleoclimatic data and that sort of thing, Northern Africa was a wet place a couple of million years ago. And there was seasonal rainfall, there were cattle there, there were the ancestors of the modern cattle, and there were hominids. So the the three variables in this environment did exist. What was the long-term impact of that? Well, you know, the, the food of the gods it basically led to the origin of consciousness and the imagination. Yeah. I read a draft of your intro, or maybe the final version, I don't know, but it's really a great exploration, review of more recent findings, but also a great exploration of language, images, imagination, consciousness, and then also Mm -hmm. the data to support this overlap of hominids with ungulates and coprophilic mushrooms. (laughs) It seems almost (laughs) inevitable that our our ancestors would have been munching on these and uh, found them very... Very interesting and compelling on, on yeah, a lot I of levels. I think so. So, so yeah, I, I just think it's worth uh, looking at this in the light of some new discoveries. I, I mean, you know, these things can never be proven, which actually makes them more fun because then you can make these wild claims and nobody can disprove <laughs> them either. <laughs> you know, so that's where we're at with them. But I think knowing what we know about neuroplasticity was the word I was looking for, that psychedelics foster neuroplasticity. Epigenetics provides a mechanism for inheritance. And so I think that changes the speculation from plausible to maybe more than likely. (laughs) Yeah, this stuff is endlessly fascinating to me. And I want to return for a second to the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, because you, you mentioned something that I just want to underscore And that is to do these things, that is to further the Knowledge Preservation Project, Bionosis, the Ethnobotany course, and many other things you are currently looking for support. If you don't mind saying, if you can, is there a specific number that you have determined will allow you to pursue these projects with the the resources required to really gain some degree of traction with with them. Yes, I mean we have we have a rough idea we're undertaking a capital campaign, now fundraising campaign. People should feel free to visit the website and donate if it grabs you, but we're looking to raise about 600,000 by the end of the year. And this is to support various projects like this. And then the Herbarium Digitization Project, which is much more ambitious and much more expensive, and it's going to stretch over a couple of years. What we're dealing with is essentially an herbarium, which is a gem, a scientific gem, but it's in a third world developing country university. So there are a lot of deficiencies. For example, At this herbarium, there's like 100,000 specimens, but at least half of them aren't even mounted. Mm. So we want to get enough funds to complete the herbarium, essentially, and then link it into various online database resources for natural products, pharmacology, genomics, and so on. Just create an open access resource for anyone with an interest in Amazonian flora, you know, it doesn't have to be medicinal or psychedelic or whatever the interest. And that's probably going to be a two to three year project that will cost somewhere north of a million dollars, but it will be well worthwhile. It's just, again, I'm a big believer in collections and collecting knowledge. That's the thing. Knowledge collections are important. And like every plant, that you can attach a piece of information to enhances the value of the plant, you know, and provides a reason not to drive it into extinction. Important. Yeah, once they're gone, they're gone. You've mentioned a phrase in a number of other interviews I listened to 
that I'd love for you to define because I don't know the phrase and I'd, I would like to. The importance of voucher specimens. I think that was the wording. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is voucher that the right word? Specimens. What yes. is a voucher specimen? Voucher specimen, this is what Schultes used to rave about all the time. He would go on about, well, he did all this chemical work on, say, Banisteriopsis, for example. And there is a whole history of chemical investigations going back to the late 19th century, people looking into the alkaloids, the composition of Banisteriopsis. Voucher specimen is simply an herbarium specimen that you make. And if you're collecting plants and you're dragging them back into the lab to tear them apart chemically and see what's in there, you have to be able to reference a a reference specimen, essentially. So keep one that you don't tear apart, in other words. Collect pieces of the plant, make an herbarium specimen of the plant. Make several in different herbaria around the world, but at least the herbarium of the host country And then you can always go back to that because taxonomists love to question each other. And so if you have a reference specimen, you can always go back and look at the actual collection. Somebody said, well, this is Banisteriopsis copy, you know, that McKenna collected in 1981. But five years later, some other botanist may come through there and say, well, that wasn't Banisteriopsis copy. That was Banisteriopsis longiolata. You know, and these people are fools. They didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what taxonomists do all the time. You know, they fight <laughs> with each other. But the point is that the chemical investigations are documented by an herbarium specimen that you can always go back and check. And now, of course, they use DNA profiling and this this sort of thing, just another tool in the arsenal, kind of. But if you look at the chemical history of ayahuasca, if you look at who did what when they were sorting out what the alkaloids were, the first four or five investigators, I can send you a keynote about this, which you can look at at your leisure. But the first four or five groups of investigators, they didn't take vouchers. So their work is not worthless, but in some ways degraded, because there are not vouchers to document what they actually worked on. That's the thing with voucher specimens. And I mean, just to put some more connective tissue around let's just say the the amazon and the flora of the amazon how many species would you say we we currently estimate plant species to exist in the amazon in the amazon yeah about 80 to 90,000 and how how many have we and this is maybe a, a loaded word but properly studied and examined in any way what percentage? Around 10%, if that. Of course, worldwide, they're probably, they're always revising the number, but the total number of plant species, higher plant species in the world is around 240, 240 to 260,000. Uh, and I mean, it's just such a wealth of biological, not just knowledge, but practicality. I mean, you have such potential medicinal application well there's there's great discovery great potential for drug discovery because we have only looked at about 10 percent and those are the the number that you know we maybe took a superficial look at the number that have actually been thoroughly investigated is closer to one percent so there's tremendous potential to find new compounds In fact, that's another project that the McKenna Academy is working on or collaborating with a group called Woven Science, a group of entrepreneurs and and scientists and other types. And we're in process of developing a bioprospecting platform at that will be affiliated with the university in, in Iquitos. And then you get into basically a search for new molecules, screen them against a whole variety of possible targets. So this is another long-term project that will probably run into the millions if it's properly done. The McKenna Academy is kind of peripheral to it. We're, we're involved, but we're not, you know, we're a nonprofit, so we don't have to make profits. <laughs> 
but it's going to be a very interesting project. And it goes into these ethical areas about who owns this knowledge, yeah. who owns bio, this bio piracy. And- yeah, bio piracy. So we have to be very sensitive to all those issues so that we can say, you know, we're bio prospectors, not bio pirates. We want to share the the wealth if there's any return on the investment. We are committed to having indigenous people have a big stake in that, have a place at the table and a big say in how this goes forward. Because really they've been the stewards of this knowledge for millennia, really. And it's always been the case that big pharma, big science comes in, they take what they want. They say, thanks very much. See you later. Develop billion dollar drugs off these things. And that's not right. The indigenous people should get some recognition for being the stewards of this knowledge. That's the whole thing. This is what's in danger. As the habitats are impacted, the community structures are impacted, and the traditional knowledge. And one of the first things to go is the knowledge of plants. Well, Dennis, there are a million things that I could ask you. I, I didn't even get through ten percent of the <laughs> Good, questions we'll that have I. Ten more of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have we have space for many more conversations. Yeah. Uh, I want to say a few things. One is that for those people listening who also want to sort of extend their exploration of these topics, I think Mark Plotkin has also done a lot of great work with the Amazon conservation team in his mm-hmm. thinking about enabling and empowering those groups to sort of participate in in prospecting and the preservation of of knowledge he's done all, he and his and his wife and other people in the organization have done really great work and i know you guys are friends and go back yeah, really really absolutely. really really far and i also want to ask so just to just to confirm for people listening donations to the McKenna academy of natural philosophy are tax deductible since they are donations yes. to 501c3 so i will yes. the target of 600k i will commit here to kicking that off with 50k of my own my usd God. and i want to encourage people listening to consider doing the same because at 50k a pop that would be 12 people could be done very easily. This is a early stage bet, albeit in a nonprofit side. I don't expect, of course, I can't get any returns from this in a financial way, but I, I really view you as a pioneer who also has a high degree of biochemical and sort of ethnobotanical fluency who can participate and reconcile and critically examine multiple spheres. And you have a history of producing really fascinating and I think important work. And I definitely encourage people to also grab the ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs. They're in a boxed set. If you just search Dennis McKenna on Amazon, it pops right up and uh, you can purchase it on Amazon Prime. It's a beautiful collection and it will give you a taste of some of what Dennis has curated. And uh, certainly you can find his writing everywhere else. But I will commit to 50K. I encourage people to... Uh, you know, this is not investment advice. It's a nonprofit, but I, I, I really view this as as worthwhile. And you're coming into this also as someone who has proven a decades long dedication to examining and studying various facets of psychedelics and beyond, not just limited to that. Much like I think Schultes was also very, very well versed in orchids and yes, other things. One of the world's experts on orchids. That's right. Yeah. Roland Griffiths. Also, a lot of people don't realize, yeah. even though he's known for yeah. the psychedelic work with psilocybin at Hopkins, uh, one of the foremost experts in caffeine and caffeine metabolism. And so you, you have such a broad spectrum of expertise. I feel like this is worth supporting. So I commit to. 50k and i encourage people to take a close look that's incredibly generous of you tim thank you thank you for that and and thank you for encouraging your listeners to contribute if we get a few more donations in that range we won't have to do a fundraising campaign because (laughs) our goals will be pretty much met and we want to be responsible stewards of these funds you know and in that regard we're also open to people who 
they may want to support us financially, but we want more than just finances. We want advice. We want wise people. We're creating a, a, we call it the symbiotic circle, but a circle of advisors with connections to other supporters, but also ideas like people like yourself, for example. I don't know if you're interested in being uh, joining our symbiotic circle, but uh, you're certainly welcome to. Well, thank you. And I like the sound. Of, I like the sound of it. Symbiotic I'll, circle I'll sounds send like you a good information thing. about all this <laughs> stuff. I, I don't know how much time you have to go through all this stuff, but I'm going to send you the one thing a in the world that I seem to stuff. have time for is this kind of stuff. The one <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll send you more details about that that capital campaign and some of the other projects that we have. And yeah, this has just been amazing. We killed uh, two and a half hours. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's yeah, it was easy. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was easy to do, and uh, we have plenty. I have, I have enough questions. We could we could do a round two, in short order. It'd be extremely easy to do. I would encourage people to check out McKenna dot Academy. I have a few thoughts on things that could be added to the website that might be helpful for listeners. So we'll chat about that separately. I think it'd be easy to do also. But check out McKenna dot Academy. Certainly, you can find Dennis on social. Where are you most active, if you're active at all, Dennis, on social media? Well, I have people handling most of the social media for the Academy. So I'm not on there. I'm on Facebook and Twitter, but not right. uh, not much, you know. Yeah, well, that's that's why you get more done. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't <laughs> say that, but it, it helps. It helps. But I would love to have more conversations with you, Tim. Online and offline. And, yeah, I would uh, enjoy that. This has just been, been uh, this has just been incredible. You're a fantastic interviewer. I'm sure I'm not the first that told Thank you that. You. Thank and, you, Dennis. Uh, and you're informed. <laughs> you, you really do your homework. So that's that's a huge thing. I think it could not have been gone better. I mean, yeah. we could talk all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Easily. And I, I'm only you know, 30, 40% of the way through volume two of uh, ESPD. And this is one of those fields, I'm sure it's true with a lot of fields, where the deeper you go, the more fascinating and the stranger it all becomes. And, mm, you know, it's, and, and you spoke to, at the very, very well, maybe it wasn't in the beginning, maybe it was in the middle, about some fears around, and this is related to uh, some of these syncretic churches, of science removing the mystery or the wonder. And it makes me think of, surely you must be joking, Mr. Feynman by Richard Feynman, famed <laughs> physicist, who later in life developed a deep friendship with a painter. And mm -hmm. the painter had the same concern about Richard through his scientific lens, removing the wonder of, say, the beauty of a flower. And Richard's perspective was, actually, you've got it completely backwards. Exactly. Because I can have the aesthetic appreciation. I am acutely aware of how much I don't know. And I can also be dazzled by the scientific findings when you go down to the microscopic level and look at this beautiful thing in front of us. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I find it so reassuring in your representation of these multiple facets that these are not mutually exclusive silos, even though there's so much goddamn infighting in the psychedelic space. It's kind of comically tragic. We're this humans, is, you yeah. know, that's what we do. But, <laughs> but I, I am totally on the same page with you about this. To my mind, science properly pursued only deepens the mystery. Yeah, That's yeah. the thing. It doesn't take the mystery away. It shows you how mystery exists profoundly at every level. That's the whole idea of the McKenna Academy being a mystery school. The mystery is the mystery of existence, which is which is bottomless. It's endless. And science is one of those tools we have not to take the mystery away, but to make us appreciate what the mystery is. And I'm thinking of something that when I had a couple of exchanges, they said, Tim's going to ask you, what would you put on a billboard? You know, and well, we didn't get to that, but I was thinking about that. What I would put on the billboard is what I get from ayahuasca and other psychedelics, which is remember how little you know, 
<laughs> Remember how little you know, and science often forgets how little it knows. Yeah. So it can be kind of arrogant at times. But you can't be a true scientist without being a mystic, I think. You know, mm. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, the deeper you probe, the more complex, the more beautiful, the more intelligent it all seems. Yeah. And this is why I think we have to appreciate science, but understand it's not the whole story. It's not the end of the story. It's just a useful tool. Yeah, we're all holding different parts of the elephant, like that parable. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Dennis, this has been wonderful. I will follow up on the donation, which for clarity, I'll, I'll make through my foundation, okay. uh, which is explicitly for this type of thing. Could not be more excited. Is there anything else you would like to mention to listeners? Any closing comments? Anything like that? Anything you'd like to direct their attention to before we wrap up for this round one? No, I think we've covered it pretty well. I would say look at the website. We have resources there. We have events which have been done in the past that you can still register. They're all recorded. Think of it as a place for resources and so on, but also get in touch. We want to be open. We want people to bring their talent and their their wisdom and everything else to the table and their money, but that's not necessarily <laughs> that's not necessarily the the most valuable thing. Money is just the grease that lets the thing run. Yeah. So there is that, but we're we're trying to bring together brilliant people and propagate this worldview, this idea that we're out of sync with nature essentially, and that psychedelics is one way to help us realize that and help us get realigned with nature because that's the big challenge that we face right now. And, you know, and then that could spin off into another three hours of discussion. So <laughs> we won't go into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and uh, for those people who want maybe a cliffhanger or a teaser, I wanted to focus on a lot of the science and the biographical stuff in this conversation, but we, we didn't even get into some of the really strange and weird stuff, which <laughs> we might next time. <laughs> that, that's uh, another, that's another yeah. one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave that as a, as a teaser for a round two. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. This has been wonderful and so much fun for me. I've been really looking forward to this and have done so much reading and I can't wait to do more. I'm looking forward to it. And to everybody listening, as always, we will have links to everything in the show notes that we've discussed. Of course, we mentioned McKenna.academy. That is sort of the beacon, the, mm -hmm. the, the main call to action here. Please check it out. And until next time, be safe. And thanks for tuning in. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the, uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, and just drop in your email, and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by All Form. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've probably heard me talk about Helix Sleep and their mattresses, which I've been using since 2017. I have two of them upstairs from where I'm sitting at this moment. And now Helix has gone beyond the bedroom and started making sofas. They just launched a new company called All Form, A L L F O R M, and they're making premium, customizable sofas and chairs shipped right to your door at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. So I'm sitting in my living room right now, and it's entirely All Form furniture. I've got two chairs, I've got an ottoman, and I have an L sectional couch. And I'll come back to that. You can pick your fabric. 
They're all spill stain and scratch resistant. The sofa color, the color of the legs, the sofa size, the shape to make sure it's perfect for you in your home. Also, all form arrives in just three to seven days and you can assemble it all yourself in a few minutes. No tools needed. I was quite astonished by how modular and easy these things fit together, kind of like Lego pieces. They've got armchairs, love seats, all the way up to an eight seat sectional. So there's something for everyone. You can also start small and kind of build on top of it if you want to get a smaller couch and then build out on it, which is actually in a way what I did because I can turn my L sectional couch into a normal straight couch and then with a separate ottoman in a matter of about 60 seconds. It's pretty rad. So I mentioned I have all these different things in this room. I use the natural leg finish, which is their lightest color, and I dig it. I mean, I've been using these things hours and hours and hours every single day. So I am using what I am sharing with you guys. And if getting a sofa without trying it in-store sounds risky, you don't need to worry. All form sofas are delivered directly to your home with fast free shipping, and you get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. That's more than three months, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund. Your sofa frame also has a forever warranty that's literally forever. So check it out, take a look. They've got all sorts of cool stuff to choose from. I was skeptical and it actually worked. It worked much better than I could have imagined and I'm very, very happy. So to find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash Tim. That's A-L-L-F-O-R-M dot com slash Tim. Allform is offering 20% off all orders to you, my dear listeners, at allform.com slash Tim. Make sure to use the code Tim at checkout. That's allform.com slash Tim and use code Tim at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Tonal, T-O-N-A-L. Get ready for the smartest home gym you've ever seen. That's a men's health headline about Tonal, folks, and that gives you the gist. If you're wondering about the smart part, Tonal's homepage also features a quote from the New York Times. Quote, the machine knew my strength better than I did. End quote. More on that in just a minute. By eliminating traditional metal weights, Tonal can deliver 200 pounds of resistance in a device smaller than a flat screen TV. Tonal mounts on your wall with no floor space required. I've had a Tonal unit now for six to 12 months, which I got after a number of very close friends recommended Tonal. And it allows me to do things I would normally need a much larger gym for, like cable, chop and lift, or rotational exercises, things I wrote about in the four hour body. And it allows me to do these things that are nearly impossible otherwise, like eccentric loading, which I'll mention later. Tonal is precision engineered and designed to be the world's most advanced strength studio and personal trainer. It uses breakthrough technology like adaptive digital weights and AI learning together with the best experts in resistance training so you get stronger faster. So what are these adaptive digital weights? Tonal's patented digital weight system makes thousands of calculations a second to deliver you a smooth weightlifting experience using advanced electronic motor technology. Tonal lets you adjust the weight in one pound increments, something that was never possible with traditional dumbbells. Easy to dial weights up and down with the touch of a button right in the grip itself. It's pretty cool. Tonal also has built-in dynamic weight modes like chains, eccentric, that's E-C-C-E-N-T-R-I-C, and their patent-pending SmartFlex technology so that you can experiment with more ways to get stronger, faster, without the hassle of extra equipment like chains and bands. And it, once again, fits on the wall like flat screen TV. So you can make the best use out of the smallest footprint in your home or garage, wherever you end up putting it. So try Tonal, T-O-N-A-L, the world's smartest home gym for 30 days in your home. And if you don't love it, you can return it for a full refund. Visit www.tonal.com, that's T-O-N-A-L. And for a limited time, get $100 off of the smart accessories when you use promo code TIM100 at checkout. That's www.tonal.com, promo code TIM100. Tonal, be your strongest. 